Good morning from the garden and welcome to today's video in which I want to take you around our permaculture kitchen garden and show you some interesting things that are happening here now mid-July. My name is Vera Hrutin. I'm a permaculture gardener, designer, author and teacher in the Netherlands. And in today's video I want to show you what polycultures I'm growing this year, what vegetables we are trialing, how we're preparing the garden for the hot weather that is to come in the coming week and also what we are doing now to ensure that we'll still have plenty to eat into the autumn and winter. Let's start with the bed that I'm standing next to, uh, in which I am growing my Dutch polyculture. If you have watched some of my previous videos, of if you, or if you have my book Edible Paradise, then you uh, will be familiar with my passion for designing polycultures around different themes. Uh, in my book I have a, a Mexican polyculture and an Easter polyculture, polyculture. I have also done an Italian polyculture but I thought it was about time to do a Dutch polyculture since we're living in the Netherlands. And um, here we're growing vegetables that are typical for in the Dutch cuisine, like carrots, beets, kale, a very popular one. But we're also growing some climbers. And this was one of the tips that I gave in my spring video about the different ways to maximize your kitchen garden. And that is to include um, to put supports and grow climbers and I often do that I put uh, this trellis at the north side of a bed and here I'm growing um, gherkins which are just about to beginning to set fruit uh, but also some climbing beans and another another interesting thing here is I have included lots of um, flowers, in some cases edible flowers and herbs in the polyculture in order to confuse pests and attract pollinators and so on. So for example here I have a nigella, um, I can't remember the English name, but it's, it's been sown in between the rows of carrots in order to confuse carrot fly. We'll see how well that works, but in any case I think it looks rather pretty. In the bed next to my Dutch polyculture is a different mixed planting. I have some corn in the north uh, corner of the bed, but there are only four plants, so I'm not sure the, uh, the pollination will be sufficient. I had very poor germination. Um, but there are also leaf vegetables, such as this beautiful chard variety called peppermint. It's probably the prettiest chard. Uh, there are lettuce plants in between, there's parsley, there are marigolds with edible petals. Um, here is nasturtium, one of the best edible flowers, and calendula. And again, um, in this planting, the flowers, apart from being edible and adding a sort of ornamental value to the planting as well, are attracting pollinators and other beneficial insects. Now let's look at some of the trials that I'm doing this year. If you're a returning viewer, you might know that I did a um, trial of different kale varieties last year and this year I have only selected the ones that I liked the best um, in the past. So last year I think we grew maybe 10 different varieties. Now it's been reduced to about six, including the ones in my uh, Dutch polyculture. Um, some are very, very ornamental as well, like the Tuscan kale, cavolo nero. Um, but I have chosen these because we like the taste best and we liked the productivity. So we'll see whether it was not just a like one year occurrence and whether they will do well again this year. And again, uh, to make good use of the space, I don't know whether you can see, but the kale has been interplanted with lettuce. And the lettuce also benefits from a bit of the shade that the kale is casting because, of 
course, lettuce is uh, not really a plant that enjoys hot and warm weather. It's also another bit of a trial because I have researched what varieties will shoot of lettuce should go best with hot weather. So uh, those are the, some of the ones that I'm growing now, um, as opposed to the varieties that I grew in early spring. Another trial that we're do doing, and it was a bit of an accident, an unplanned one, is different uh, potato varieties. Originally, I only planted one, a whole bed of one variety called Annabelle. It's a very early potato and we already harvested all of it. But then uh, our neighbors asked whether we wanted to some of their su surplus planting potatoes because they received a double, uh, their order was accidentally doubled. And uh, that was very kind and they had some really great varieties, some of which I know, but some of which I've not grown before. So I planted up this bed with three plants of each variety and there were seven in total but i have um, yesterday i harvested the first two the very early varieties uh, which were anne and um, belle de fontenay uh, but as you can see some of them are still looking quite vigorous so i'll be harvesting the varieties in succession and uh, of course another interesting thing here is um, how susceptible they are to blight, which is always a problem in where we live, at least. But I'm also very curious about how the taste with, will compare. So we're planning to do a taste test. Hopefully my son will participate, because I think it's always interesting to have uh, more than one person's opinion when it comes to taste, because taste is a very personal thing. Maybe we can even get my daughter uh, if she uh, comes home to participate. Um, and I would like to film a video about it, but it will still be some time before all the potatoes have been harvested. The next trial that I want to tell you about is happening in the greenhouse, so let's head over there. We're forever searching for the best tasting cherry tomatoes and um, a couple of years ago I did a trial of I think seven varieties and we also did a taste test with my children so if you would like to see that you can uh, uh, look for that video I'll also put it in the description box below and this year I'm growing the favorites that came out of that video which was Asterina Sun Gold everybody's favorite and uh, but also Brad's Atomic Grape and Black Cherry was one of the the other favorites but I'm not growing Black Cherry I'm growing uh, Black Opal which is supposed to be an improvement on that one but next to these I am uh, I'm pitting uh, another varieties other varieties against these champions from past years uh, we're growing other tomatoes from the sun, the sun family. There's sun peach and sun cherry smile, for example. Um, so we'll see how these compare. And again, if, if we have the time, if I can get my kids to cooperate, I would like to do a taste test. I have filmed um, several videos about how we utilize the limited space of the greenhouse. And usually we do uh, we divide it into thirds and in one third we grow um, plants from the nightshade family, which is usually tomatoes. Uh, then there is plants from the cucumber family. Here we have a courgette for an early harvest, but it will, I think it will go now and we'll plant more, um, more basil. We have some cucumbers. Uh, and in the third part we usually grow sweet potatoes. This year we're doing something different. I'm growing two tropical varieties of beans and beans are nitrogen fixers so that's something including those in your crop rotation is very good for the soil and because they will uh, the nitrogen will stay in the soil after the plants have been harvested so you're virtually fertilizing the soil for the next crop. I think the best way to make use of the greenhouse is always to grow vegetables vertically. In that case we have uh, two things and this is uh, yard long beans. These are just beginning to grow so they're very thin yet but these are supposed to be up to a half a meter long I think. It's the first time I'm growing them so I'm curious. 
Um, and then there is hyacinth bean. Not much to see there yet. And they're already, they already reached the roof of the greenhouse. So um, I'm curious about this little trial. And then one last thing I want to point out is this lettuce. We always grow um, lettuce here in the winter and I'm also trialing usually um, hardy varieties of lettuce. Um, this is a plant that's been here since September or October and now it's flowering and I'm letting it flower because I want to save the seeds. Saving seeds of lettuce is, is fairly, is, it's one of the easiest plants to save seed from because it uh, self-fertilizes so you don't have a lot of cross-pollination but also here in the greenhouse it's fairly uh, isolated from other plants so it's a, it's a good way if you want to do some seed saving to do it that way. One last trial that I want to share with you is happening over here and it's different varieties of red leaf chicory or radicchio. In this bed in spring we grew sugar snap peas and spinach and lettuce and now that those have been harvested uh, the bed has been planted again and this also goes back to what I said in the beginning. Um, what are we doing now to ensure that we'll have plenty to eat in the months to come? That the abundance that the garden is giving us now will continue. Um, I am trialing different, six different varieties of radicchio or red leaf chicory. Uh, they are named after, after different uh, cities of uh, towns in uh, uh, Italy like Di Treviso, Di Castelfranco um, and so on. And uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. I have grown a few varieties, but I have never grown them um, in the same year next to each other. So that's always the best way to compare how they will perform. It's also one of the prettiest vegetables uh, that you can have in your fall garden, I think. To ensure that you will have plenty to eat, not only in the summer, but also later, uh, it's always good to do succession planting, not just so one once and um, then have a glut in the summer and nothing to eat later on. Um, we do that with many vegetables and here's an example and that's corn. These are plants that were sown um, about three to four weeks, three weeks ago and planted only two days ago and I expect these to give us harvest in September which is after our vacation but before our vacation we'll be harvesting the corn that I sowed much earlier and um, that will be ready before we go on vacation. Another example of successional sowing is here and uh, it's bush beans. We have some bush beans in that bed that are already in full production. We've been harvesting those for uh, several weeks now and those I sowed inside in April already and planted them as soon as uh, there was no danger of frosts. Um, but I have a second sowing of bush beans here which are just starting to come up uh, and there they were sown in bed that, um, that where we grew our early potatoes Annabelle. So after those were harvested like within an hour <laughs> I planted the next crop. Those were just um, those were not sown inside those were just uh, I just let them germinate in a bit of water and um, soak them in water let them germinate and then planted the beans that I saw that were germinating. I'm not only growing a succession of vegetables but also a succession of cut flowers. Uh, for example here I have zinnias that I just started cutting but at home I have uh, already small plants that will be sort of uh, the next uh, next crop. These will continue uh, to flower for some time but they can get tired especially if it's a uh, uh, very hot weather and get some uh, disease problems but then by then I will have a next zinnia crop ready. Um, you might have noticed I'm growing cut flowers at the in several of my beds in the south end. Um, I've grown cut flowers. I like to have cut flowers in my garden always. Um, I have grown them in different ways. Sometimes I had a bed that was dedicated to just different kinds of cut flowers. 
this year I'm sort of spreading them around the garden. Um, like here, here are three different cut flowers, Malope. Um, I'll put the names. Uh, I, I can only remember the, the Latin names at the moment, but I can put them on the screen. Anterinum, snapdragons, I remembered. And as you can see, those are also good for pollinators. Can you see? Bumblebee. But um, there's, a, there's a sort of another advantage to putting them within my vegetable beds. And that is um, when it comes to watering and care, what often happens is that I will prioritize vegetables. So that meant in the year, a couple of years ago, when I grew a bed of cut flowers, I always left that one last because food seemed more important. So that was the last one to get watered and, and uh, to get out of care. And this way, by putting them next to my vegetables, I ensure that they will be watered when I'm watering my vegetables. I mentioned in the introduction that we're expecting very hot weather in the coming week. The temperatures could reach 40 degrees of Celsius, which depending on where you live might or might not seem very hot to you. It certainly seems very hot to us. And thankfully it's still rather um, uncommon occurrence. But um, the weather is very hot anyhow and, and dry. And the most important thing we do to ensure that the garden can cope with that is mulching. We use different varieties for mulching. Here you can see a bed with tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, um, some last lettuce because that was the previous crop and zinnias that was mulched with um, straw. But we use different materials. Like I said, this bed, for example, was mulched with uh, the wood chip that was on the paths path last year. So it's partially composted and it works well for some vegetables. We also use um, things like grass clippings or uh, coffee grounds, um, other stuff. But there's one material that I have not tried yet and that I want to try, and that's uh, wool, sheep's wool. Um, I am an avid knitter, but this year I also, uh, in spring, I started to learn to spin wool. And um, I've become quite obsessed. I'm currently doing a breed study and uh, spinning samples of 40 different sheep breeds. So that's very, very interesting and absorbing. But the workshop where I learned um, to spin is here in the quite close by. That was uh, lucky for me. And they also have uh, sometimes wool that cannot be used anymore, sort of uh, uh, waste. And they offered it to me to try for mulching. So that's what I want to do. It's the first time that I'm using wool in the garden. I know of other gardeners who have done it. Um, I'm particularly interested on its effect on slugs, though now that it's so warm and dry, there are no slug problems. So um, that would be more, be that would be better, a better trial to do in spring. But I would be very interested if any of you have used wool in the garden as mulch and what your experiences were. The last thing I want to share with you is this bed. Um, which is full of perennial edible flowers. It's only been planted about a month ago, much later than I would have liked, but other things got uh, <laughs> in the way. Um, it's something that I have been planning from since March, I think, but then I got a um, um, commission. I was invited to do a uh, to plant several borders at the horticulture exhibition Floriade Expo in Almere, which was a great honor and uh, very exciting. And I also wanted to particularly showcase edible flowers that people might be growing as ornamentals and not know that they're edible too. So I took that idea that I had for this bed and uh, planted it on a much bigger scale in Almere. But then I um, f finally, about a month ago, I got to planting it in my own garden. Um, so the plants are not 
very grown yet, but this, these are perennial plants, so this is a bed that will stay, um, that is supposed to stay here for a couple of years. We'll see what we do uh, uh, later. It might also, one of, one of the things that I'm considering is using it as a sort of nursery bed for my uh, forest garden. So that means um, nurturing the plants here until they get stronger and then dividing them and planting them out in my uh, edible forest. But um, this is a, the sort of very central bed in, uh, within, the, uh, within my kitchen garden. And um, these plants are not only um, edible or medicinal, they also, they're also great pollinator plants. So this is sort of a double function here. And they look pretty. So that was um, all that I wanted to show you in the garden, but there's one more thing I would like to mention and that's concerning my book Edible Paradise, because I had several people message me that they wanted to order the book, but it was not available. It is available in America, but it's not available in Europe currently. I asked my publisher about it and the problem is that their warehouse is moving and that's why they cannot ship at the moment. But it's been going on for some time, so that's very unfortunate. Um, however, I do have some copies of the book myself and if you're in Europe or elsewhere and do not mind paying the postage, um, you can send me an email and I'll be very happy to email you the, uh, to not email, to send you the book and of course sign it if you may wish so. So that's it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and please let me know in the comments what you're up to in your gardens um, because I know there are viewers from all over the world and it's so ex interesting for me to know what people are growing in different climates. I hope to be back again soon, probably one, one of the videos on the trials uh, that we are running. But until then, happy gardening!